Hey, I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour, and I'm somewhere near my home in western Wyoming, stumbling over rocks and brush because I want to show you something really cool that I just found. Check these guys out. This is some kind of very old Native American art. And let me tell you, I don't know anything about stuff like this. What I know is there's a red centipede sleeping bag man with some spears. I don't know what that means. I don't know who made this. I don't know why they made it. I don't know what the process was that went into it. I certainly don't know when it happened, but what I can tell you for sure is that it happened and it's here now. Likewise, when we talk about the Old Testament canon, we don't have a crystal clear picture of exactly when and how that came together, but what we know for sure is that it came together and there was some pretty clear notion of it by the time that Jesus shows up on the scene in the first century. So in this video, I just wanna talk about the Old Testament canon how it happened, where it came from, what we know, what we don't know. I'm Matt, this is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. Here we go. All right, if we wanna understand how the Old Testament canon works, the first thing we gotta do is separate our New Testament canon brain from our Old Testament canon brain. These are different for several reasons, but here are four quick ones that come to mind. Number one, the New Testament canon happened in a very tight time frame right after the life of Jesus and running up to about 90 AD. Now, decision-making and the whole process of that, which we talk about in other videos, yeah, it took a little bit longer, but the writing was very compact, whereas the Old Testament, it purports to cover thousands of years of history and to have been written over a thousand years and change worth of history. So there's a big distinction there in terms of just some of the natural questions of how you think through what is canonical and what is not when you have that kind of a time frame to work it through. Picture this. If we talk about what is canonical and what is not with the Star Wars universe, well, it's pretty easy because we're mostly having that conversation within one cultural moment in time. But if we have a discussion about what is canonical in terms of the absolute gems of Western literature dating all the way back to the age of the Romans... Ooh, that's a lot harder question, right? Well, what are the criteria? Where did it have to be written? Do we need representation from each of these ages? The classical, the medieval, the modern, the right now is tougher. Okay, so that's one distinction. A second distinction between New Testament canon questions and Old Testament canon questions is that of authorship. In the New Testament, a lot of the credibility of the books is attached to the name of the person who wrote it, and the early church recognized these writings as being authoritative in part generally speaking, um, because of who stood behind the document. And it looks like all the authors of the New Testament sat down and wrote it. It doesn't look like there were later editors who came in, and the more manuscript evidence we have, the more evident it is that that's how these books were originally penned. Old Testament, a little different. We don't know who wrote some really big chunks of the Old Testament. Did maybe Samuel had to do with some of the histories even books like uh, Kings and Chronicles acknowledge that they're depending on sources. Who wrote those sources? I, I don't know. But those books are regarded as being authoritative and canonical, not because they're attached to an author. And even with an acknowledgement that it looks like there were probably a lot of contributors, they're authoritative because they were regarded as true and an accurate reflection of what happened over centuries and centuries and centuries. Likewise, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, you know, they hold themselves out as having been written by Moses. I think they were written by Moses, but I'm pretty sure chapter 34 of Deuteronomy, the very last chapter of the Pentateuch, was not written by Moses because it's about Moses' death. And surely no one who was reading this way back in the first place was like, oh, I bet Pet cemetery style, Moses' decrepit, rotting hand reached up out of the grave, left-handed, I guess, and wrote chapter 34, and then I died. Now I may rest in peace. Now everybody knew that somebody added that to round out the story because the story needed rounding out. So again, you've got a very different set of parameters because of the time and the authorship questions that come with time and because of the acceptance of some of these books having multiple contributors with the Old Testament than you have with the New Testament where it happened in a tight window of time. We seem to know who wrote it and it looks like they wrote it at once. A third consideration, I guess I've kind of referenced in the first two, is just the rate of assembly. New Testament happened very, very fast comparatively. Old Testament not only happens slow, but it happens with 
major sea changes in the political and social landscape of what's going on, and even the language changes over the course of the Old Testament. You've got crushing military defeats. You've got the Assyrians wiping out five-sixths of the Hebrew Jewish people, and then you've got the remaining two tribes ending up in Babylon and then Persia, and then they move back. And this is this is all over the map. And so what people are going to value, how stuff is going to be circulated, is going to change a little bit based on those pressures. And we also know that for a time in the Old Testament, for crying out loud, the Bible was just lost. The book of the law was missing until the high priest Hilkiah in the reign of Josiah in... Yeah, I should have the reference on this. I'll put it up right down here. Discovers the book of the law and they're like, whoa, that's incredibly good. And we're super sorry. We didn't remember what that was before. That was not Superman. That was, I'm so sad that I'm tearing my robes because I forgot God's law and now I need to probably obey it. So we have this long time frame evolution of the Old Testament. We have this very short time frame evolution of the New Testament. But there's a reason for that, and this is my fourth distinction between asking questions about Old Testament canon and New Testament canon. And that is, there was a ton of pressure on the New Testament, on the, on the early church, to figure out what the canon was. Just about a generation after the death of the last disciple, John, you've got people messing with the original documents, you've got people who have a theological bias toward a different expression of Christianity that they want to see get some traction and some headway. And so Marcion, who we've talked about before in Rome, he posits a, a canon of scripture that has altered documents and cuts out a whole bunch of stuff that everybody seemed to agree as Christians was legitimate Bible or, or to be regarded as scripture. And so there is immediate pressure to codify or to make absolutely clear what everybody is reading as scripture, and that seems to be the impetus that makes the canonization process go. In the Old Testament, you don't have all of that cultural mingling that you have in the New Testament, where the message of Jesus goes out to the whole world, now you got Greeks and Latins involved and North Africans and all these other assumptions and beliefs are factoring in. It's for everybody. Well, if it's for everybody, we better get clear on this thing before it mingles with everything else and becomes a different religion. Whereas, in the Old Testament, even though God's promise to Abraham way back in the beginning was that Abraham would be a blessing to all the nations, and even though I believe it was clearly intended to be for everybody from the very beginning, uh, it's not really how it played out. It was a very ethnic religion. It traveled with the Jewish Hebrew people as they moved around throughout history. And so that pressure to get this thing nailed down before somebody else comes and, mess, and messes with it, it really wasn't there to the same extent. And as soon as it really was there in the later centuries covered in the Old Testament, the 5th century, the, uh, the 4th and 3rd centuries BC, that's when I think we really see this thing gel and get locked down because those external pressures are in place. Was that a lot? I feel like that might have been a lot, but we got a bunch of good stuff to go. So Old Testament... Uh, no, wait, I'm doing it over here. Old Testament canon and New Testament canon, they are a bit of a different equation, but hopefully that sets us up to look at a few more specifics here and make sense of this. In order to make sense of the next part, you're going to like this. We went ahead and did craft time with the family so I could make visual aids. step in framing up this very foreign question of how this ancient Hebrew canon came to be is to understand that this, just the idea of a book in general, is a very relatively recent modern human innovation. For most of human history, we didn't write stuff down like this. We didn't present knowledge like this. A lot of what we did was write it on scrolls, and scrolls have certain limitations, and scrolls come with certain implications for how you 
curate knowledge and take care of it and how you might gather it into various categories. So instead of picturing something like this that my kids made, which is a list of all of the books of the Hebrew canon in order as they do it, uh, it actually looked a little bit more like this. You got a bucket that contains the scrolls associated with, in this case, the first of the three phases, the first of the three aspects of the Hebrew canon. And this one is called the law. The law, once again, is that stuff we've been talking about that Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And you might be wondering, well, why do we call it the law? Because there's all kinds of history in there and uh, some you know, kind of literature, poetry, song of celebration, things like that. How can we just call that the law? Well, the reason we call it this, or I should say the reason it's been called this historically, is because that's the main characteristic of this chunk. It's the main thing that you derive from it. So here, God is giving to his chosen people how he wants them to act, what he wants their society that they're about to set up to look like, and and the granddaddy of them all in Exodus chapter 20, he gives them the Ten Commandments. So that leads me to the next point as to, well, when was this regarded as canon? And I think the answer is immediately. I mean, if the story is to be believed, and I do, and you may not, and that's okay, that Moses literally went up on a mountain and God appeared and gave him this information, these commandments on tablets, and then he came down and God demonstrates his power. I mean, it's kind of instant canon. It's not like, oh, wow, it's a really beautiful song that that guy wrote. Is it good enough? Does it count? We should have a council and a committee and we should, oh, no, 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 no. The miracles happened. That's definitely from God. These are the touchstone guidelines for who we are. And in addition, the law in and of itself describes itself as, as being canon. doesn't use that word in Deuteronomy chapter 31, though. Moses orders this stuff that he is writing, presumably he's not done with it yet, to be placed alongside the Ark of the Covenant as, well, because it's regarded as being from God and obviously Scripture. So the law is Bible from the get-go, but it only covers a certain chunk of time. Act 2, or Division 2, if you will, is called the Prophets. And the prophets are a little different deal than we have it, because you might be looking at this and you're like, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a lot more than eight prophets in the Old Testament. What are we doing here? But you need to know that one of these in the Hebrew division of their scriptures is called uh, the Twelve, or the Book of the Twelve, and it's what Christians call the Twelve Minor Prophets. So that's all lumped into one, and that's part of the way the math ends up working out. Now again, with the prophets chronologically, this covers some stuff that dates back into this range, and it covers some stuff that goes forward. They cover some history. There's, again, some poetry and literature and so forth that goes on in here. But the main characteristic is prophecy, that these characters who God raises up to communicate with his people as they are a nation, as they are defeated as a nation, as they live in exile, as they try to rebuild after being in exile, the prophets are this main voice. They characterize this chunk of documents, and this is how God communicated to his people in different circumstances. And also, it accounts for where God was directing his people, even in the future, and how stuff was going to work out. So the prophets is the second division. If this was canon and codified, and everybody's real clear on it at the time it was written, some people would say that is around 1400-ish. Some people would put that at a later date. The prophets... Well, there's not one neat, tidy date because there's a huge range in when these things were written. So these were almost certainly each individually regarded as prophecy as they were being written and unfolding. But ultimately, they are regarded as a group, a segment, probably sometime after the exile, uh, maybe in the 5th, 4th, 3rd century, something like that. Third division is called the writings. Now, the writings, that sounds like kind of a, an elusive term, uh, but in the first century, they called these the Psalms. Why would you call them the Psalms? Well, because the Psalms are in there, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, all of this kind of stuff. So you have this, this wisdom literature angle, but you also have history in here. 
Most of the history here is toward the end of the story, toward uh, the time that the Hebrew people spent in exile. But again, you got stuff here that dates back all the way to here, or maybe even earlier than here, and you have stuff here that kind of rounds out the end of the story. But additionally, in this last collection, the writings, you have what Christians call First and Second Chronicles. In the Hebrew um, canon, it's just one single document called Chronicles that covers all of it. I don't know, maybe we divide it up or they didn't because of scroll lengths or who knows how we do it. But whatever the case, Chronicles is this very last book in terms of the order. Now, obviously, when this was all being formulated and gradually adopted by the Hebrew people, you can see there isn't really an order here. Who knows which scroll you're going to pick out? And does it really matter if you read Psalms first or Proverbs first or Job? It doesn't matter at all. But Chronicles fits into this chunk, and I think that's part of what gives some structure to the order of these books, because Chronicles comes last. Now, there are a lot of reasons that we know this, but to me, one of the most interesting is Jesus himself. Jesus, in a very sneaky, subtle way, affirms that this order of books was already in place by the time the first century AD rolls around. Now, Jesus very famously at the end of the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 24, affirms the threefold division of Scripture. He says the following, it's right here. Um, <laughs> why don't I write these things down? Here it is, verse 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So Jesus the Bible that he read was codified, there was a canon, and this threefold division was in place. We have external corroboration on that threefold division as well from Josephus, who's hiding back here behind all of this stuff. Uh, he wrote a letter that maybe we'll have time to quote here in a minute that deals with that. Um, Philo of Alexandria acknowledges this division as well. He was a uh, and a Jewish Egyptian philosopher, late first century. But Jesus gives us a little bit more about this chronological arrangement that gradually came to displace the scrolls in bucket arrangement. Let's see if I can make this stand up here, because visually that'll communicate it better. And that is in Luke chapter 11, maybe toward the end here. Yes, verse 50 and 51. And this is contextually maybe confusing. Jesus is... Uh, shooting back at some of his critics and talking about how people are missing the point. You can look that up and dig into the context if you want later. It says, Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Again, dig into that meaning and context on your own. But what is Jesus talking about? Abel. Okay. Oh, whether you're looking at the Hebrew canon or the Christian Old Testament canon, Abel as the first prophet. Okay, well, I don't know, I think of him as a prophet necessarily, but um, Jesus knows and he's better qualified to say who is and who isn't than I am. But Abel is the first martyr. He's the first person killed for representing God in what we call the Old Testament, right? Right at the very beginning, Cain, he's like the you know, these are the, the second round of humans, and one brother kills the other. The ungodly brother kills the godly brother. Okay, we all agree on that. But Zechariah? Ah, aren't there like lots of Zechariahs? Which one? Who are we talking about? If I go to the very end of my Old Testament, oh, what do I get here? Well, there's Zechariah there, but it's not even the last book. And Is that even the same Zechariah? And did he even get killed? What's going on? Ah, but remember... The Christian Old Testament is organized differently than the Hebrew Old Testament. And the very last book of the Hebrew Old Testament is Chronicles. And the very last person to get killed in what we call Second Chronicles is Zechariah, whose blood was shed in the way Jesus describes. In other words, what he's saying is not A to Z. This is in a different language. It's a coincidence that it happens to be A to Z for us. What he's saying is, from the very beginning of the first book that we have now organized into chronological order, all the way to the very end of the last book that we organized into chronological order, everything in here has a whole bunch of people who got killed by zealous folks who didn't recognize a prophet when they saw it, and y'all will be held responsible for that, speaking to his enemies. Aha! So Jesus had this order. We've got external corroboration as well that 
the canon was not only in place, but that it was a, a long established tradition that it came in a threefold bundle and that um, it was organized in such a way that Chronicles came at the very end. What else do we know? Well, we also know that there was a fourth category of writings that people kind of wrestled with. And before I bring this in, out here, I'm going to ask for patience from my Catholic friends. And I do have those, by the way. I like Catholics, and we agree on a ton of stuff, but I'm using the term here, apocrypha, for these extra writings. But remember, I'm not talking about the Christian Old Testament canon yet. I'm still talking about the Hebrew canon of Scripture. And the Hebrew canon of Scripture does not include what uh, Roman Catholics and some other expressions of Christianity call the Apocrypha. The actual book list is unique amongst the different groups that include the Apocrypha in their Old Testament amongst Christians. But in general, you've got a batch of uh, seven to a dozen books that are kind of in the rotation, mixed in with the Old Testament amongst different groups. Protestants do not acknowledge these books uh, overwhelmingly. I'm not aware of any who do. From the get-go, including books that are from the Apocrypha, um, Second Maccabees, I believe, there is a reference to these extra books that were floating around and that seem to have had value. There's language about the intentional preservation of these books after persecution, but there's ambiguity at best, overt separation at worst, and you can arrange the best or worst however you want, amongst everybody who talks about this, including within the Apocrypha itself, about where this thing fits. Now, this gives us a good opportunity to talk about some of the manifestations of the canon that we see chronologically. So let's just do this real quick. Um, obviously, the, uh, the threefold is the Hebrew manifestation of the canon. This is probably in place by uh, 400-something B.C., maybe 300-something B.C. at the latest. There's a cultural-religious split with some sort of Jewish people called the Samaritans. They come up a ton in the New Testament. They're from the northern half of Israel near a town named Shechem. They think they should worship at a different place than the temple in Jerusalem. They worship on Mount Gerizim, and they embrace the Pentateuch with some slight alterations and reject everything else. This doesn't fit with the Samaritan narrative. Most of this does fit. And so the Samaritan Pentateuch is one of the earliest expressions of what we would call the Old Testament canon. Additionally, there is this tradition that starts in the Old Testament whereby leaders would stand up and read from the scriptures, but the scriptures are kind of complicated. And what they would do is put it into common vernacular and even offer commentary on the text as they would read. And this tradition evolves into something that's called the Targums. And we know that this was going on for a long time before the time of Jesus, but the two earliest written copies of this kind of oral tradition happen around, the, I don't know, I think the 400s, the 5th century AD. And we have two, and I cannot for the life of me remember the name of those, but we'll pop them up over here. And what we can tell is that this robust tradition that did not develop for the first time ever in the 5th century AD, but that had been in place for some time, was, um, was expressive or representative of a canon tradition that went back centuries and centuries and centuries. So you got that. Then additionally, you have um, an expression of the canon that would be contemporary with Jesus in the 1st century AD, written in Syriac, which is a... Uh, a cousin language to Aramaic, which was the, the common tongue that Jesus and his disciples would have spoken. And this Syriac canon looks just like this canon. Um, I guess then you have to go all the way forward. Oh, no, no, I'm forgetting the Septuagint. <laughs> uh, I promise I do this for a living. The Septuagint, this is like the most important arrangement of the Hebrew Old Testament in terms of historical value and evidence moving into the Christian era that we have. The Septuagint is a translation from the Hebrew Bible into uh, Greek. This happened in Egypt, third century, bleeding on into the second century. There's a legend surrounding this that um, 
the the 70 some scribes who were gathered 72 scribes who were gathered i think six from each tribe is what that was supposed to represent they were locked in separate rooms and each and every word and detail was identical it has some pretty mystical difficult to prove even difficult to believe overtones to it but the shred of truth that is present in that legend and i think there are shreds of truth in most is that the tradition of how carefully the Hebrew people copied their scriptures, the Israelite people, the Jewish people, we're talking about a lot of different eras here, uh, can't be exaggerated. Unbelievable care was taken in making sure every jot and tittle and detail is exactly right. So the Septuagint gets the law done first. So now there's a Greek version of this floating around the Eastern Mediterranean world, and gradually the whole thing gets done. We don't have any early copies of this at all. We've got some uh, late classical copies, I think. One is called uh, Codex Vaticanus. One is called Codex Sinaiticus. Uh, and Alexandrinus, I think, is the third. I hope that's right. But we have three complete expressions of the Septuagint from about five, maybe 600 years after the fact. And what we see there is a canon that includes a little bit of this. Now, those three earliest copies of the Septuagint that we have don't agree on which scrolls from this bucket should be moved over into here somewhere. One will have these two, another might have a different two or three. You get the illustration and the point, I think. Then by the time we get into the very late 4th, early 5th century, an absolute Bible literary genius comes on the scene, someone to whom everybody Christian and otherwise owes a cultural debt, St. Jerome. Jerome was tasked with translating the whole Bible into Latin. Now, he would have had access to a ton of Greek Old Testament and Greek New Testament, but he gets done with the New Testament part, and he's like, you know what? I'm just not satisfied with translating from Greek, which is already a translation from Hebrew. That's getting into telephone, copy of a copy. So the guy goes back, becomes a master of Hebrew, no doubt had all kinds of access. I think he worked out of Bethlehem, you know, which is pretty Hebrew. He had all kinds of access to early manuscripts. And he takes his stuff and he makes a legit Hebrew to Latin translation. And if you're a Catholic and you use some expression of the Vulgate in a Latin mass or whatever, you are using a direct translation from Hebrew. I mean, this is a this is a monumental accomplishment in the history of translation and literary work in general. And uh, the the work that he did lines up so beautifully with the work that was going on contemporary to that with Hebrew scholars who obviously weren't big fans of what was going on with the Christian canon. Um, but we see this gigantic overlap. Now, Jerome took this fourth bucket and was like, it seems like these are important and people care about them and they teach and they matter. And in his notes, which we still have access to, he does separate these out into a separate category as being valuable, but not regarded by the Jewish people or Christians as falling into this camp. Now, again, not going to do a video here about whether the Apocrypha should be in the Bible or not, or the Deuterocanon, as those who disagree with me on its value would call it. Um, rather, what I want to acknowledge is that this was a point of debate. These books were always regarded as valuable, and they were always floating around on the periphery. Some Christian groups embrace them, some do not. So here's the deal. We add up all of this stuff, and what we see is, I think, a pretty cohesive process that had a funneling effect from here's a whole lot of data that we've regarded as being from God and scripture for a long time, but when the pressure finally mounts for a, a codification, a clarity on what these things are because of exile, because of cultural mingling in the, the later centuries getting toward the time of Christ, that is when we see this impulse toward we need to really clarify what this is and where this stuff fits, and further, it takes on this form and gets organized up in this manner. So, this is where I would leave it. The canon of the Old Testament was very clearly in place by the time of Jesus. This is made evident by the fact that 
though there are some turns of phrases and subtle references in the New Testament that look like an acknowledgement and an awareness of these types of writings, Jesus only quotes from these writings. The New Testament only quotes from these writings with only two exceptions. Jude references uh, something called the Assumption of Moses and the Book of Enoch, neither of which are in the Roman Catholic Apocrypha anyway. Now, again, this is a place where Protestants and Roman Catholics respectfully have to just accept that we disagree. Roman Catholics would say, what? Those aren't just vague passing references. Those are really clear references. And here's a list of a hundred of them. I've looked up every single one. And I thank each and every one of you who've taken the time to patiently and kindly submit those references to me. I think you have a point. It does look like there is an awareness in the New Testament of this writing. But in terms of direct quotation and acknowledgement of stuff that is scripture, it looks like it's limited to this writing. And not every book in this writing gets acknowledged in the New Testament, but most of it does. Again, a respectful agree to disagree with people who might read this data a little differently than me. And what I would urge you to do as a viewer who maybe doesn't have a strong camp one way or the other, or maybe does, but just would like to understand what other people think a little better, would be to just dig into it. There's all kinds of resources around the internet, and you can land wherever you need to land on that. I don't own the Bible. I didn't write it. I didn't organize it. I really like trying to figure it out and wrap my brain around how it all works. But wow, we can, uh, we can get along great and be allies in this whole conversation, even if we arrive at slightly different conclusions on this one. The Old Testament canon was in place. It was in order. The book seemed to have been very clear. And even if we accept the narrative that there was still some lingering debate that got settled at the somewhat obscure Council of Jamnia around 90 AD amongst only uh, Jewish people, Hebrew scholars, it looks like they arrived at the same conclusions that had already been arrived at and maybe just solidified and clarified that, meaning that this Old Testament canon is pretty dang steady amongst the, amongst the Hebrews. And at some point it evolves into a Christian canon, and that gets into a little bit more of this debate about this stuff. All Christians agree on this part of the canon. We just aren't totally in agreement on whether this little bucket belongs over here in part or in full as well. Okay. I set out to make a seven minute video that would be really efficient because I'm covering big topics right now that take a lot of time to, to work through and they just make for long videos. I failed in that. So this was a lot of content. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I hope you learned some stuff. As always, I hope that this kind of thing just prompts you to be able to go and think about it more for yourself and figure out what you want to do with it or don't figure out what you want to do with it. It's okay to leave some of these questions in limbo. I think sometimes we put too much pressure on each other to feel like you right there. What's your stance? Where do you land on this right now? It's okay to think for a while and it's okay to think something for a while and then see some different data and think something different. Part of the beauty of of what it is to consider these things is that the God who purports to be on the other side is a God of grace. That's how he holds himself out. And not just a God of grace for people who do naughty things or bad things like I do from time to time, or even really screwed up things, which I've also done from time to time. But it seems like what we're seeing here is a God of grace also for the mind, a God who understands that um, some of these questions are going to be hard as the finite interacts with the purported infinite, and uh, that might take some time. And so if it seems that uh, the God of the Bible is patient with us as we think, I think there's huge benefits to, to us being patient with each other and imitating him in that. So absolutely love this community. I love the way you interact with each other. You're gracious with me. Thanks for kicking this around. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do it again soon.